Good evening. Last week we looked at the final study of Abraham. And I told you that we were going to cover chapter 23 and 25 and that this week we would look at chapter 24 because while Abraham does play an important part of this, the focus isn't really on Abraham, it's on Isaac. And this is beginning our study and our look at Isaac, the, the son of Abraham, the promised son, the one who would go on to be the father of Jacob, and ultimately he would be, you know, the grandfather of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this is an interesting study. It's interesting because what we find is the cultural manner in which they picked wives at this time. It's an, it, we don't really see this place in very many parts of the Bible. We don't really have much record of it of this time period anywhere, but this is giving us an idea of how they chose their wives, how they chose the spouses for, indi for individuals. And in Genesis chapter 24, what we're going to find is a wife for Isaac. It starts off with the realization that Abraham's going to make a request. In verses 1 through 3, we read, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. You know, it's interesting. I once had an individual, we were talking about this, and uh, reading through and studying different things, and and this person said, you know, that just shows. Her father, you know, his father just picked a wife, just went and grabbed this woman and forced her to marry Isaac. And I said, you hadn't read this before, have you? You hadn't studied this at all, have you? Because Rebecca has more say in this marriage than Isaac does. That's a simple reality. As we study through this, Rebecca has more say in whether or not she's married than Isaac. This is not an attack on females. This is not anything that's inappropriate. This is how marriage was done. It might seem odd to us today. It might be something that we don't really understand. The idea of a father, or in this case, a servant to the father, going and picking out the spouse for the head of the house, it's odd. But in some parts of the world, we still have arranged marriages, and it was a common practice for years. So it's something to consider and understand before we make just bold statements or make accusations against God or against his represent representatives on earth. We might ought to look and study a little bit more. But here is a request that's been made. He has requested, will you please go and find a wife for my son? In fact, what he says is do not get a wife from these Canaanites. He looked around. And this is probably based on the reality of what he saw Ishmael and his wife and the children they had. More than likely, he looked at the women around. He saw the problems that Lot's children had. He saw the problems that Ishmael and his family would have. He saw the individuals in which the land he dwelled. These are not God-fearing people. These are not people that promote um, much faith in, the, in the, what they have. So he looks at them and he tells his servant, he makes him promise the idea of putting his hand under his thigh. That was uh, a solemn vow. Again, something culturally we don't understand. That's not something we do today. That might be the equivalent of, you know, a handshake promise. But he makes him vow, he makes him promise, you're not going to get a wife from these Canaanites. Don't do it. So we have the request. And we have, in response to that, a promise. Now, Abraham is going to show his faithfulness to God. In verse 7, we read, The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from, the, from there. Abraham tells the servant, I want you to go back to the land of my people. I want you to go, and I want you to get a 
why from there God is going to take care of you. God is going to provide his providence, his direction, his guidance so that you can find the right woman. But then look at how much faith and how much obedience Abraham demonstrates. In verse 8, he says, And if a woman is not willing to follow you, you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. First and foremost, we see that Rebecca had a choice in whether or not she came with the servant. But more importantly, Abraham was told, Get out of the land of your fathers. And he held to that so strongly that a point in which his son now needs a wife and he's going to send his servant. You understand? He didn't send Isaac. He sent his servant. He probably, you know, would have sent his servant anyway. But he tells his servant, you do not take Isaac where God has told us to leave. Can you see the trust the faith, the obedience to God. You know, it also might be a little bit of foresight. He definitely had the right idea. We understand that Isaac will have two children, Jacob and Esau. Jacob will go back to the land of his fathers. He'll go to the land of his mother. And a lot of problems happen there. They get stuck there for years. So maybe Abraham had the right idea. Don't go back to where God told us to leave. You know, when we look at that today, God has told us to leave our old life behind. God has told us to be an old creature, to put to death the old man, to leave the old life behind, and to go into a new direction, a new path, a become a new creature. We cannot go back. Abraham told his servant, don't take Isaac back. So we have a promise, we have a request, we have a promise, a promise that God will be there, God will provide, God will ensure that this is a successful venture. But also in that promise, a showing of his trust and his obedience to God. But now let's look at the woman. <clears throat> Who is this chosen woman that will be the wife of Isaac? You know, providence is an amazing thing. The servant of Abraham gets there and he prays to God. It's a beautiful prayer. Full of worship and praise to God and acknowledgement, kindness towards Abraham. But he prays to God concerning what he's going to do. We read in verse 11. And he made his camel kneel down outside the city of the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of men of this city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher, that I may drink also the, a drink. And she says, drink, and I will also, and get, also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now look at this next part. He has just made this prayer. Abraham has promised. Abraham has told him God will guide you. He trusts in Abraham. He trusts in God. He prays to God. And it happened before he had finished speaking. Then behold, Rebekah was born to Bethel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And a servant told, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Rebecca comes out. He asked 
God, take care of this. And as he is praying this, God is taking care of it. You know, we look at the Bible, we often have talked about providence, and, and it's a very tricky, tricky subject. You look at your life and you go, well, you know, I, I had two paths. I could have gone this way or that way. And you go, if I'd gone this way, things might have been a whole lot different. And you go, well, I wonder if it was God's providence that led me down this path. And we wonder, we don't know. You can't clearly see God's active will in our lives sometimes. But we know that through God's providence, his will is accomplished. And there can be no doubt that the providence of God puts Rebecca right there at that well at that exact time. He does as he says he will. Rebecca responds appropriately. They go to their father's house. He talks to her father. He tells them and everything. There's a whole lot that takes place here. They ask her, will you go? And she says, yes, I'm ready to go. She makes the decision. I want to go right now. I want to meet this man right now. And we see the end of the book, the end of the chapter. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother's, Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Isaac didn't know what was going on. He's out in the field. He's coming in. He goes, what's going on here? He, the servant explains everything to him. They look upon each other. And Rebecca became his wife. You know, there is, again, a lot of things here that we could discuss. The faith that Rebecca clearly had to have in God to trust God that God would provide for her, the reality that she is willing to leave her family to go and to see this man at the word of a servant. Oh, so much that could be discussed, but the reality is this is simply part of their life. An arranged marriage takes place. But God is in every part. And what I really want to look at is the reality that in this chapter alone, God is mentioned 14 times. Mentioned. I'm not talking about the times in which God is actively working. I'm not talking about the times in which we see God's hand playing through the events. God is directly mentioned 14 times. His work is seen throughout. You go through this. In verse 3, Abraham called on the servant to swear by God. In verse 7, Abraham declared God's will provides guidance. He declares God will provide guidance. In verse 12, the servant prays to God. In verse 26, the servant worships God. In verse 27, the servant praises God. You see the servant being a faithful worshiper, a faithful follower of God by the actions he demonstrates here you know it's a little bit odd you, you go well why would he call him the god of abraham well how does god introduce himself you know when god introduces himself to Ab to moses he says i am the god of thy father abraham that was a common manner in which god introduced himself so it makes sense that that's how the servant would address him as the God of Abraham. But he was a follower, and we see that in the reality that he prays, worships, and praises God. Laban, the father of Rebekah, acknowledges the servant as being blessed of God in verse 31. 
The servant declares the great blessings of God upon Abraham. He's singing God's praises, basically, in verse 35. The servant speaks of God's guidance in his prayer in verses 40 and 42. The servant speaks of his worship of God in verse 48. As he's going through, and the reason we skip so much of the chapter is what happens is they go to her father's house, and he immediately starts basically telling everything that has taken place, all of it. He goes through and he says, this is what happened. Here's what Abraham said. Here's what God did. Here's what God's done for Abraham. Here, you know, he goes, I'm laying it all out for you. He mentions God over and over. In verse 51, Laban acknowledges God's plan for Rebekah. And then in verse 52, the servant starts worshiping God again. When they desire for him to stay longer, in verse 56, the servant begs them to be allowed to leave immediately. And he says that because of what God has done. He goes, God has guided me. God has blessed me. He has made this, they make this work. He goes, I need to go home now. I can't just linger. They wanted her to stay 10 days, more than likely uh, due to purification and, and other things necessary during that time. They wanted her to stay 10 days and prepare herself to go and to be wed. But the servant says, no, God's done all this so far. He's, he's made everything happen so fast, so wonderfully. We need to go now. Verse 63, Isaac said to him, meditating in the field. When you look at that, it is a clear reference to dwelling on the law of God. Even Isaac, you know, Isaac's not mentioned really throughout this chapter. I said to you, you know, I told you this is a story about Isaac, but the reality is Isaac, he's mentioned in the beginning, go find a wife for, for Isaac, and he's mentioned at the end as having been out in the field meditating. I mean, you search, you do research on what it means when he says he's meditating. It's the idea of I will meditate upon thy word. He is dwelling on the world, the word of God. God is seen throughout this chapter. So it makes us wonder. We don't see any direct intervention by God. God doesn't speak to the servant. God doesn't speak to Rebecca. God doesn't, you know, appear as an angel and, and direct and guide. If we didn't have the Bible telling us this is what God is doing, we might say, oh, this is a bunch of coincidence. Happenstance, just pure chance that he happened to meet upon. You know, that's what we would say. But what this chapter does, what this so beautifully demonstrates for us, is that God has an active hand in the lives of his servants. That he is guiding them, that he is helping and preparing them. And there is nothing in the word of God that says that God is still not actively helping us today in the same way. His providence is still very much in work today. So you ask, why look at the wife of Isaac? What's so important? Well, I mean, one could easily say that it's important to study this because Esau and Jacob. Without Jacob, there is no Israel. Without Israel, there is no Christ. But another important reason that we look at chapters like this is it reminds us that just because God is not actively seen doing something supernatural, it doesn't mean he's not working. That he's not in the background constantly helping his children. The providence of God is seen throughout the entire chapter. And the acknowledgement, the manner in which we should praise God, the manner in which we should give God the glory for all that he does, should be a lesson to each and every one of us. How often do we tell people, you will not believe what God has done for me? How often do we 
live our life in such a way that other people, this is the servant of Abraham. This isn't Abraham himself speaking. How often have we lived our life in such a way that other people will go and say, man, you will not believe what God has done for them. What type of life did Abraham have to leave that the servant of Abraham felt that it was important to tell others what God had done for him? God's providence and our attitude towards God are forefront in this chapter. And they're things that we should learn. As we said, the chapter ends with Isaac being comforted in the death of his mother. When it says that she went into the tent of Sarah, his mother, it's basically giving us the idea that Isaac has taken a wife and now he has moved. He, he is more than likely going to be classified as the head of the family. That's the general idea. But when we look at this, when we study things like this, it shows us God's love for his children. It shows us the love of a father for his son. Both the physical father Abraham and the heavenly father God. This evening, God still loves his children. And there can be no doubt that he's still actively working in the world today. We don't see his hand moving, but we know it is. Are we giving praise to God for all that he has done? Are we thanking God for the unseen blessings that have showered down upon us? We should. We need to. This evening, if you were here and you were not a child of God, understand that the greatest blessing, the greatest gift that God has given to us is the Son of is His Son Christ. His Son who came to this earth and who died so that we might have life. His Son who did what was necessary, who was the ultimate sacrifice. For us. Will you not do what is necessary to be a child of his? Will you not believe? Will you not change your life through the act of repentance? Make a confession that he is the Christ. And that will you not be baptized so that you might have life? If you've done that in times past, but somewhere along the way you've struggled, you've fallen off the course, perhaps somewhere along the way you've realized that you have neglected to give God the glory. Let's learn to be like the servant of Abraham, obedient to our master, trusting in God, and willing to praise God for all that he has done. If you're here this evening, you need the prayers of the church. Now's the time as we stand and as we sing. Come to Jesus, he will save you. Though your sins and crimson flow.